When I was a little girl, I have lots of memories of my mom who kept a big box under her bed filled with old family photographs. And I remember kneeling down on the floor with my mom and pulling that box out from time to time, sifting through those old family photographs. And as a little girl, I had no idea who was in those images. But I listened to her stories, and she would introdu introduce me to these faces and help me understand how they connected with me across time. The image that you see here played a really powerful role in my identity formation growing up. My earliest memories of it consist of me sitting on the floor with my mom holding this image, which is a carte de visite. Anyone from the history of photography knows that term? Um, and really, you know, just peering into the surface, wondering who she was. I remember learning that it was my, it's a picture of my great-grandmother, my mother's mother, who I've never met in my life. My great-grandmother stayed in Germany after her daughter, my grandmother, immigrated here to the States. I remember touching the surface and feeling the divots in the surface and wishing I could put those pieces back there so I could see her more clearly. I remember thinking she's beautiful and pretty and wondering, gosh, will I look like that when I grow up? I also have memories of being introduced to this postcard and also admiring it as something beautiful, a beautiful object. The script is pretty, it's in German, I don't know what it says. I could make out that it said Theodore at the top of the postcard and Elise at the bottom, and I knew that this was a postcard that my great-grandmother, who you just saw pictured in the last image, wrote to her husband when he was away at battle in World War I for Germany. And I also remember understanding what the red text at the top of the right side of the postcard near the postmark said. About a week after sending this postcard, it was returned to my great-grandmother with the words, words killed in action on it. And I remember picturing her writing it with her five little girls playing nearby and wondering what it must have been like receiving that postcard and how she went forward. That postcard changed everything about the way I related to this image this woman on the, the surface of this photograph turned into a hero, someone incredibly strong and courageous. And I connected with that as a person. And as I grew up and became a woman, I carried that with me. Now, something really incredible just happened in your brains as I told that story, according to research anyway. That was my story, that, that's part of my personal narrative. What research about neuroscience has told us is that when someone tells a story, certain parts of their brains are activated. And we also know, and by the way, the study has been done through MRIs, looking at the visual renderings from MRIs, people actually laying in these MRIs and listening to recordings of brains. When you listen to that story, Similar parts of the listener's brain is also are also activated. This is a process known as neural coupling. Google it if you're interested. It's fascinating stuff. And what it does is it reminds us of something that we're not very good of in higher education. It reminds us that in higher education, we are so focused on the cognitive domain of learning, the acquisition, the construction of knowledge, but we don't often integrate the effective domain. Emotion is a core part of learning. It's what makes learning memorable and transformative. Those are the memories, that, those are the learning experiences that you are likely to carry with you in your life. That is deep learning. So why is this important for us here at a conference about innovations in blended and online learning? Why is that valuable? Well, empathy is what we're talking about here. And we know that empathy lays the foundation for connecting people. It's like opening the door and inviting someone in. That's an important part of an online class. It's the beginning of foundation, or it's the foundation of community. 
So for a moment, reflect on that story. Think about how many formal um, disciplines could be connected to that story. History, photography, feminism, gender studies, political science. What are your stories? What can you bring into your class? What could you share? But the other part of that is remembering that it's about listening to the human voice. And over the past 10 years, I've used asynchronous voice conversations and storytelling in my online classes. And from my student surveys, I found that my students tell me when I spoke, I remembered more of the information compared to when I only wrote it. It's not about replacing writing, it's about enhancing writing. Listening to peers increased my ability to achieve the learning objectives. 95% of students strongly agreed or agreed with that. And listening to my peers made me feel more connected to them. So I ask you, why is it? Why is it that so few students learn out loud in our online classes? That's the question I have for, for you all. Especially in a moment in time when 96% of our undergraduate students have access, they actually have a smartphone, which is a handheld recording device. There are more tools than ever to enable these types of interactions. And more captioning services than ever to ensure they are accessible to all learners. So the question I'd like to pose to all of you is to reflect on what you've learned here today and ask yourself, what are the barriers that prevent learning out loud from happening in online classes? There is no correct answer, but I really want to encourage you to send a tweet, and if you're not on Twitter, maybe this will be your first tweet, and include the hashtag OLC Innovate. I look forward to seeing your responses. <laughs>